First uh, Kings for a moment, and I want to share with you a thought here from First Kings chapter number eight. And uh, look there at First Kings eight and verse number sixty-two. The Bible says, "And the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord." And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered unto the Lord, two and twenty thousand oxen and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. The same day did the king uh, hallow or, or make sacred and so on, like holy and set apart unto the Lord, consecrated really. Then the same day did the king hallow the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. Because the brazen altar that was before the Lord was too little to receive the burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat and peace offerings. And at that time Solomon held a feast and all Israel with him. A great congregation <coughs> entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt before the Lord our God seven days and seven days, even fourteen days. On the eighth day he sent the people away and they blessed the king and went under their tents, notice this, joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had done. Joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had done for David and his people and for Israel, his people. Uh, God's people in the Old Testament, God's people in the New Testament. God's people have always offered their tithes and offerings unto the Lord. In the Old Testament days of the people of Israel, of course, there was a system of sacrifices and so on that were offerings unto the Lord. But I love to see here how they gave their, their offerings unto the Lord and sacrifices unto the Lord. And you know why they did it? Because they were grateful people. And I always believe that grateful people are giving people. If we'll be grateful for all that the Lord has done for us, we'll be a giving people. We may not have much, but we'll, we'll have a heart to give because grateful people are giving people. I love the little statement there about them. They, they went into their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had done. They didn't go back to their tents thinking, boy, we sure did a lot for God today. No. They went back to their tents grateful. They went back to their tents after all of their giving, after all of their offering of sacrifices and so on, joyful and glad of heart for the goodness that the Lord had done for David his servant and for Israel his people. These people were grateful people. They thought, boy, our God has sure been good to us. And what a privilege it is that we can offer unto Him these offerings. What a privilege it is that we can offer unto Him these sacrifices. And, and our motivation in giving should be because we're grateful. We're grateful for all that God has done. We're grateful for the goodness of the Lord in our lives. Let's be faithful in giving our tithes and offerings unto the Lord. People can give when they come to church and use the offering box or... So occasionally we pass offering plates. We've been forgetting to do it most of the time. But you can use the offering box or people can give online now by sending any transfer. And the details of that are, are in your bulletin. But uh, let's be a giving people. That's how God will, will take care of the needs of the church. But it's also a way that you can show God I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your goodness. I'm grateful for your blessings. I'm grateful for all that you've done.
1 Kings chapter number 14. And uh, I'm just going to share with you a very simple thought this afternoon and probably a very, a very short thought here this morning as well. And uh, this is just something uh, that in uh, doing my devotions and going through the book of Kings, I wrote down a few thoughts that I want to share with you here this morning. 1 Kings chapter number 14. And why don't we stand together for the reading of God's Word, if you can do that, physically able to. 1 Kings chapter number 14. And we'll look there at verses 1 to 5 probably to begin with, okay? 1 Kings chapter 14 and verses 1 to 5. The Bible says at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam. And get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be a king over this people. And take with thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey, and go to him. He shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose, and went to Shiloh. And it came to the house of Ahijah, but Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask of thee a thing for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, for it shall be when she cometh in that she shall feign herself, shall fake, shall pretend herself to be another woman. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just use a very simple thought this morning to challenge us about our own life and how we're living and the importance of the choices and decisions that we make. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. A few simple, very thought, simple thoughts this morning. We see here in this chapter that nothing is ever hidden from the Lord. Nothing is ever hidden from the Lord. Jeroboam was a king who was going to really uh, lead the people, God's people, into deeper sin, greater sin. And God was going to judge or God was going to punish Jeroboam and the nation for their sin. Uh, here we see in the story again where... Uh, the son of Jeroboam gets sick. Jeroboam says to his wife, can you maybe go to this prophet Ahijah and maybe, you know, maybe he'll be able to tell us what, what's going to happen, what the Lord's going to do. You know, maybe even he has some hope that the son would be healed. I'm not sure, but he says to his wife, he says, when you go, I want you to go disguising yourself. I want you to go with them not knowing who you are, not knowing that you're Jeroboam's wife. But I find it very funny, right, that here's the Lord, and the Lord says uh, to Ahijah, the wife of Jeroboam is coming. <laughs> the wife of Jeroboam, she's coming to see you, and she's going to feign herself. She's going to uh, maybe wear a mask. She's going to uh, put on certain clothes that wouldn't be like that of the, you know, a, you know, a king's wife and so on. Maybe she'll put on different makeup or something, but somehow she's going to feign herself to look like someone different. And the Lord knew it all along. You see, nothing is ever hidden from the Lord. May I say that when you and I live in sin thinking that we're hiding it, it's never hidden from the Lord. It's never hidden. We may be able to hide it from our parents. We may be able to hide it from our pastor. We may be able to hide it from other people, but we're never hiding it from the Lord. What you do, Caleb, in secret, the Lord sees. What you do thinking that people don't know, pastor doesn't know, I, my parents don't know, God knows. God knows. And we need to live with a consciousness and an awareness that, you know, Paul, God sees everything that you do. God sees everything that I do. There's never a time where you're, you're, you're hidden where God's eyes cannot see. God sees it all. 
And God will judge us. I want you to notice what happened here in this, this, this chapter. Uh, verse number 6. So we see in the first five verses that nothing was hidden from the Lord. God, God knew what was going on. God knew the trickery and so on. And God knew all of Jeroboam's sin and the way he was leading the kingdom in the wrong way. But notice what it says there, verse 6 to 10. And it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why, why feignest? Why, why are you pretending? Why feignest thou thyself to be another? Why are you faking it? He says, For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. I'm sent to you with some bad news. Verse 7, Go tell Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent or, or tore the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it to thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in his eyes. But hast done evil above all that were before thee, for thou hast gone and made the other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and hast cast me behind thy back. Verse 10, Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon all the house of Jeroboam, and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam, as a man taketh away dung, till it be all gone. What had happened? David, King David, you know King David, most of you, right? He was going to face some consequences because of his sin. He'd sinned with Bathsheba. He murdered uh, Uriah, uh, Bathsheba's husband. There was consequences to David's sin. We talked about that not long ago. And David's, one of David's sons, Absalom, would end up leading a rebellion against his father. But David was going to lose some of the things that he had. David lost the child that was conceived there with Bathsheba. There was consequences to that. And the Bible says in these verses that we read that Jeroboam was allowed to take the kingdom at this time. But God says, the Lord says, Jeroboam, I'm against you. And I'm going to judge you and I'm going to punish you because of the evil that you've done in my sight. The evil that you've done. You, you've not been like David... One of the, the forefathers, and so I mean, not been like David, who tried to bring people in the way of the Lord, who tried to lead people to love the Lord. David, who loved God. But you instead have done great evil in my sight. You've allowed these false gods to be uh, taken in place and so on. And look there at verse... Um, uh, verse number 7 again. Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent or tore away the kingdom from the house of David and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David. David was somebody who served me, and David was somebody who loved me, and David, though he had lots of sin and reasons why God ended up punishing him as well, David did have a heart for God. David loved God. It says David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in my eyes. Verse 9, God says about Jeroboam, but hast done evil, Jeroboam. You hast done evil above all that were before thee. You've done evil worse than some of the other kings that have gone before you. For thou hast gone and made the other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. What an amazing thing. Jeroboam, you've just, you've pushed me aside. You've cast me behind your back. You've led the people in such a wrong way uh, that you don't care what I think. You've put God behind you and said, I'm going my way and I'm going to lead how I want to lead. And you've made these false gods. You've made new uh, images and idols and so on for the people to worship to or offer sacrifices to. But God was seeing it all. God was seeing the wickedness of Jeroboam in the way he led the nation to, towards evil. And that's why God was going to punish him here. That's why God was going to judge him. He said there at the beginning of verse 10, Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam. Why was God going to punish Jeroboam? Because he led the people to evil. He, he did evil himself, but he also was leading the people towards evil. May I say this as well. The Lord will judge those who turn their back on Him. 
The Lord will judge those who turn their back on Him. Again, some thim- simple thoughts that I scribbled down here in my devotions. The first thought was this, that, that nothing is ever hidden from the Lord. And just like Jeroboam's sin and Jeroboam's evil and all that he was doing that was wicked in the sight of God, God sees you and me. And when we do wickedly and maybe think, well, I'm getting away with it or God's not punishing me. No, there's going to come a day of reckoning as well. Nothing is ever hidden from the Lord. God sees all that we do. And secondly, the Lord will judge those who turn their back on him. That's what Jeroboam did. He turned his back on on God. No, I I don't want to go God's way. I don't want to follow in the way of David, who loved the Lord and had a heart for God. He turned his back, kind of hid God behind him, if you will. Hid God behind his back and said, I'm going my way. I'm going to lead the people my way. I'm going to lead the nation my way. And he led them towards evil. Note at the the very end of verse 10. God said this about him when he's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge you and I'm going to bring evil of Jeroboam upon your house. He said, And him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it all be gone. gone. Um, dung, in case you don't know, is manure. It's manure from the animals, Okay. I grew up on a farm. My, my grandfather was a farmer, and he had dairy cattle and, and hogs and different animals. My dad was a beef farmer and uh, grain and cash crops as well. But I, I know what dung is. I've seen a lot of dung. I've stepped in a lot of dung. I've, I've shoveled a lot of dung. Amen. I've cleaned a lot of stalls with a lot of dung. All right. Of course, the beef cattle were in big barns and just, you know, a herd of beef cattle and so on. But the areas get filled with dung because animals do what what animals do, right? That's right. (laughs) And God is so disappointed in all the evil of the nation that Jeroboam led them to. That he says, I'm going to remove it like dung. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to take it out. I I, I want it gotten rid of. I remember uh, days at my grandfather's farm where there was there was several stalls uh, in in the barn at that farm where, you know, maybe different times hogs were kept in there, cattle kept in there, different things. But 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 small stalls uh, that might have whatever, several pigs and their slop and so on. I remember times uh, in there with a uh, pitchfork or shovel, different things, you know, cleaning out those stalls. Sometimes if we had it working, there was a kind of like a, almost a conveyor type system that went along the edge of the stalls that they could just shovel everything into there. You could shovel all the dung into that and it would take it out and up and pile it, pile it outside. But if that wasn't maybe working, then you'd have to have brought a wheelbarrow into the barn and you're there and you're, you're scraping up all the dung and you're shoveling up all the dung and you're taking it into a wheelbarrow and outside and you're going and putting it in a dung hill. You're putting it in a big pile of manure. Now, that gets used later for fertilizer, amen. But, but may I say that you remove the dung. You can't let that be piling up and piling up and piling up uh, in the barn. And I thought about that as I, as I read that verse. I thought about how the stalls would have to be cleaned out because you, you want it to be clean in there. You don't, you don't just let it stay there. You clean out the dung. You clean out the manure. And you take it out to a dung hill. You take it out to a manure pile. God's saying, that's what I'm going to do. All of these things and all these false gods and all of these idols and, and images and things you've made. And people now, they offer their sacrifice to these false gods. And you've forgotten me. You've put me behind you. And you've got all this. I'm going to remove it all like dung. I'm going to get rid of it. You know why? Because God is holy. God is pure. And God wants there to be holiness. You know what God wants her to be in the life of a Christian? Holiness. Purity. A clean heart. A clean life. The Lord was saying that he was going to remove that which was awful and sinful. He saw Jeroboam sinning against his goodness and not following the Lord and and turning his back on God and said, I want to remove all that which is awful. Remove all that which is just dung and it's unclean. I'm a holy God. That's not what I want for my people. That's not what I want for my nation. And may I say, that's not what God wants for our homes. That's not what God wants for your life. God wants you to be a holy, clean, pure vessel unto him. 
maybe need to be some things that need to be cleaned out, gotten rid of. God hates our sin. God sees our sin. It needs to be gotten rid of. Notice this there. We saw that at the end of verse 10. Notice verse 11. The Bible says, Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat, for the Lord has spoken it. Arise therefore and get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. The, the prophet Ahijah says to Jeroboam's wife, because of all of Jeroboam's evil, this child's actually going to die as part of God's judgment and punishment on Jeroboam for his sin. Look down in verse 14, verse 14. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what even now? For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken uh, in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of this good land which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their groves, provoking the Lord to anger. They've made these places where they've offered all their uh, abominations and sacrifices to false gods and idols and so on. Verse 16, And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin, and who made Israel to sin. And Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Terza. And when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died. And they buried him, and all Israel mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of the servant Ahijah, the prophet. See, the Lord was going to punish Jeroboam. There was going to be consequences for his sin. Consequences for his wrong. And again, sometimes we may think in our sin, I'm getting away with it. God's not punishing me. It's all right. He, maybe he doesn't see or maybe I'll, I'll just get away. But may I say there'll always be consequences to our sin and God will always punish. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, the Bible says. The Lord was going to punish Jeroboam. Remember these thoughts this morning that nothing's hidden from the Lord. There's nothing in your life that's hidden from the Lord. Just as God saw Jeroboam and saw the evilness that he was doing and saw the way he was leading the people to evil, God sees your sin. God sees my sin. And the Lord will judge those who turn their back on him. Listen, don't turn your back on the Lord who's been good to you. Don't turn your back on the Lord who saved you. Don't turn your back on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, live for him. Love him. Serve him with all of your heart. Don't let your life, as, as the New Testament talks about, become all entangled up in the world again. God set you free from that so that you can live for Him. He wants to purify you. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be a people uh, set apart for Him. He wants you to live a life that is holy and consecrated unto the Lord. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen, if you're a Christian, God doesn't want you conformed to the world. He wants you transformed to be like Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to, to have all this filth and iniquity of the world upon you. He wants you clean and holy and pure for Him. Consecrating yourself, consecrating your heart, consecrating your life unto Him. That I want to live holy. I want to live clean. I want to be pleasing to Him. God sees all we do. Nothing's hidden from the Lord. The Lord will judge us when we turn our back on Him. He can punish us. And He punishes us because He loves us. And He's just trying to correct us to bring us so that we might get right with Him. So that we might live as God wants His people to live. God says, I have such a desire for holiness and purity and cleanness that I'll remove some things like, like dung. I'll get rid of it. I don't want it there. You and I need to realize that there could be things in our life, and there probably is things in every one of our lives that are not good, not right. Things that are sinful. Things that are not pleasing to the Lord. And we, maybe we need to shovel it, get it out, so that we might live clean with a pure heart before the Lord. The Lord punished Jeroboam. There were some consequences, wasn't there? He, he would lose his kingdom and so on. He'd also lose his son, 
child would die as, as a result, as a consequence for his sinful actions. I want you to see one last but very important thought here in this little story. Notice what it said there in verse uh, number 16 again. And he shall give up Israel because of the sins of Jeroboam who did sin. And what's the next six words? And who made Israel to sin. And who made Israel to sin. Jeroboam sinned. Jeroboam did evil in the sight of the Lord. But you know what else? He also made Israel to sin. He also made Israel to sin. Do you know something? When we sin, we usually lead others into sin also. When you and I sin, we usually lead others into sin also. It could just be you who are a teenager. And you've got a younger brother, a younger sister, and they're watching you. And they see you sin. And you end up leading them into sin also. It could be you, parents. It could be mom and dad. That because of some of the sinful choices we make, or the decisions we make, or the temptations that we give into, and the sin in our own life, that ends up influencing our children. And they end up going into sin also in their life because we made some sinful choices, because we made some wrong choices. Can I be honest with you? You almost never go into sin alone. When you go into sin or you give into temptation or you're living in sin in your life, you're usually going to be influencing somebody else as well. You're going to be leading somebody else into sin as well. Somebody's watching you. Somebody's going to follow your example. Somebody, because of some sin that you struggle with, they're going to end up struggling with it, uh, with it in their life. Just maybe a generational sin that could be true in your children, your sons. I know everybody makes choices for themselves, but listen, we never sin just for ourselves. We usually are influencing others or leading them into sin or leading them into evil. There are people who are going to stand before God and be mightily judged for the sinful, evil choices they've made. And sometimes there's some people that have been put in positions of you know, so-called leadership in the world or people in government or this or that and are prominent people and well-known people, and listen, the choices they've made have led so many others into evil, led so many others into sin. When we sin, we usually lead others into sin also. Jeroboam, he influenced a nation to sin. Jeroboam influenced a nation to do evil, to have false gods, to make their sacrifices of false gods, to have all their hearts be turned away from the Lord. He influenced a nation, but can I tell you something? We all influence someone. We all influence someone. Could be your children. Could be brothers and sisters. Could be other family members or relatives. It could be other Christians. It could be other teenagers in the youth group. We never go into sin alone. And you've got to be careful of the choices that you're making because you're going to be influencing others. Nothing's ever hidden from the Lord. The Lord will judge those who turn their back on Him. You need to understand that your sin is dirty and filthy and unclean. God says it's like dung that I want removed. It's like manure that I want gotten out of there. God says, I wanted my nation to be holy. I want my people to be holy, set apart unto me, consecrated, holy, and pure. And God wants that today for every one of us as His people, as born-again Christians. Get rid of the dung. Get rid of the manure. Get rid of the sin in your life that is causing your life to be dirty and unholy and unclean. We, we live in this world, but we're not to be of this world. We're not to be like conformed to this world, like the world. We're to be transformed and be like Jesus Christ. We're to be a holy people, set apart. Punishment will come, consequences will come if we just go on in our sin and don't get right with the Lord. And remember this thought that when we sin, we're usually influencing others to sin. We're leading others to sin. So oh, be careful what you're doing. Be careful what you're doing. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd use this very simple lesson and thought, but, but important truth to challenge us. Lord, you see all we do.
you are desiring for us to be a holy people. You want us to be holy because you are holy. And God, if there's any dung, any sin, any uncleanness in our life, help us to get rid of that. It doesn't belong in our life. It's displeasing to you. It has a foul odor, Lord. It's not, it's not acceptable to you. It's not pleasing to you. You desire for us to be holy and clean and pure, living consecrated lives. You want our body, our vessel, to be holy and consecrated unto you. You want our eyes to be pure and clean, only looking at that which is clean. You want our ears to only be listening to things that are pure and clean and good. Lord, you want our mind to only be thinking on things and dwelling on things that are good and pure. You want our hands to only be doing things and our feet to only be going places that would be good and holy and pleasing and acceptable to you. God, keep us from the sin and filth of this world that we might be holy people. Help us to understand you see all we do and you will judge and you will punish. And God, help us to be right with you, to get right with you. To allow you to wash us and cleanse us and make us clean and make us new. We may need to have our hearts and minds renewed by the word of God. Your word can wash us like water to cleanse our hearts and cleanse our minds and make us new. And we may need that today, Lord. Help us to determine to get right with you if there's sin in our life or things in our life that we think is hidden, but Lord, you know it, it's not. God, help us to be have, a, have a, a grave realization that the choices and decisions we make and the times where we enter into sin thinking we're not affecting anybody else, help us to realize that's not true. Our sinful choices and actions are always affecting others could be influencing our children. could be influencing others who look, look at us or see what we do. God, change in our heart and life what needs to be changed. Help us to be right with you. I'm going to ask the pianist to play. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, he spends a moment talking to the Lord. something you need to make right with him is there some sin you need to confess you know the bible says if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness Are we honest with god about the sin in our life the uncleanness in our life God, I know that's not what you want for me. You want me to be holy. Consecrated. A sacrifice acceptable and pleasing in your sight. If there's things in your heart or things in your life that just know we're not pleasing to the Lord. Confess that sin. Agree with God about that sin. Ask God to cleanse you and to forgive you. Ask God to help you in putting that out of your life. Remember the thought this morning of just taking that out to the manure pile. Get it out of your life. God wants you to be holy. God wants his people to be clean. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd challenge us, convict us, help us to live holy and clean lives that are pleasing to you. Lord, help us to remember that you see all that we do. Help us to strive for purity and holiness. 
cleanness in your sight, in your eyes, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray.